Exactly. Hey, we we're wrapping up our sermon series about getting off to a good start. We, we, thought, we thought that it would be uh, very good and very beneficial for us to take a look at how we can get off to better starts. Have you ever felt like you were in a rut? You just like your life was in the same predicament and you really wasn't going anywhere. And so we thought that it would be challenging and fun and motivational if we looked about how can we get off to a good start? Because, you know, I'm sure that all of us have maybe a certain area. Maybe it's a diet or maybe maybe we're trying to get that promotion at work or m maybe we're studying real hard to make a better grade or maybe maybe we're working on some relationships. And so we thought we would take this whole month about looking at how we can get off to a good start, how that God's word encourages us to get off to a good start. We talked about, for this sermon series, we talked about three words that you need to say each and every day in the year of 2017. We talked about how that we can make good, solid priorities. We talked about how that we can develop a good prayer life. We talked about getting motivated. What does the Bible say about how we can get motivated? And this morning, we're going to wrap up our sermon series about getting off to a good start. We're going to talk about the most important issue that you will ever be involved in. The most, the most important time that you are involved with any in human effort here on earth is building good relationships. As a matter of fact, Jesus thought it was important, so important, about being in a relationship with you. He was willing to die for you. And so that's what we're going to look at today. We're going to look at how we can get serious about building good, solid, healthy relationships. I want you to notice in your message outline today, I want you to follow along with us in Proverbs chapter 18. We're going to start with verse 19, Proverbs chapter 18, beginning with verse 19. And I want you to notice with me as you read along, I want you to notice the flow of of relationships so let's pay attention an offended friend is harder to win back than a fortified city arguments separate friends like a gate locked with bars wise words satisfy like a good meal the right words bring satisfaction would you circle the right words Because if you want to build good, solid relationships, you need to know the right words. Verse 21. The tongue can bring death or life. Those who love to talk will reap the consequences. The man who finds a wife finds a treasure, and he receives favor from the Lord. The poor plead for mercy. The rich answer with insults. There are friends who destroy each other, but a real friend sticks closer than a brother. Relationships, the most important, the most important endeavor in, in life you will ever be involved with is building good, solid relationships. It's most important. As a matter of fact, it's so important. Did you guys realize that all ten commandments that God gave to Moses, all, all ten of those, are all about building relationships. Did you guys know that? Out of the Ten Commandments, the first four deal with our relationship with God. And then the rest of them deal with one another. God wants us to help get this right. God, God gave us Ten Commandments, and they're all, every single one of them, are about building relationships. And so... This morning, we're going to look at four major points about uh, getting off to a good start in building our relationships. Did a little, little bit of study uh, this week and found out that it's very important for us to start building good foundational principles that come from God's Word, from the Scripture, and especially for our young children. They're, they're now discovering that by the age of three, that most basic foundational principles relationship skills are already learned by the age three their socialization so it's important for us as parents and grandparents to help teach those 
Now, how many people, let me see a show of hands, how many people believe that even though you're an adult and you're grown and you're mature, how many people believe that God, through the help of His Holy Spirit, can teach us new relationship skills? They're all, they're all uh, teachable. And so God wants us to be teachable uh, this morning. And regardless, you might be here this morning and you might think that all your relationships are great. And that's wonderful. I, I hope that they are. But we can always learn to get better. So point number one, point number one, everyone is created for relationships. Everyone is created for relationships. God created Adam out of, out of the dust of the earth. And God saw that it was not good for man to be alone so he created for him woman and they enjoyed this relationship you are created to be in relationship as a matter of fact the two most important areas of your life is is this and if if you if you've never heard me preach this before i want you to write them down most of you already know it because i've preached it so much that you're already accustomed for me saying this your purpose your purpose in life with relationships are twofold. Glorify and edify. That's relational. That's all about relationships. You've been created for the purpose not to make money, not to gain power, not to be famous, see how many people that you can get on Facebook. But your twofold purpose in life is number one, glorify. Glorify the Father. Lift up the name of Jesus Christ. And then secondly, is to edify, to encourage and edify other people that you come in contact with. And that's all about relationships. Everyone is created for relationships. I really get, I really get worried about people who don't like people. It's, do, you, do you ever notice anyone who's just like, I don't, I don't, I don't like people. I, and they don't have the socialization skills. So sometimes it's very awkward for them to even come out uh, go anywhere maybe even you know I, I have literally known people who won't go into the grocery store until sometimes very late at night or early in the morning so they can avoid being around other people and that's awkward and, that, and that's that's really tragic is because God built us to be in wonderful creative relationships as a matter of fact even more studies done about the benefits about being in a relationship and they discovered that people who are in good solid healthy relationships did you know that you're you are inclined to be healthier in your body when you're in good relationships you ever known anybody who's in a relationship and the relationship was strained and they're stressed and they're worried and they're pulling their hair out and they're gritting their teeth and you know it has psychological effects and it also has physical effects as well. And so God says, if you want to be in good, healthy relationships, they're good for you. They're good for us emotionally. They just lift us up. They're good for you physically. The right proper hormones and chemicals are released when you're in those right types of relationships. But man, when they are not, man, it's, it's off the charts. The, it, it starts getting crazy. God, as a matter of fact, uh, we've already talked about the importance of why he wants us to be involved in relationships. We've been created. He gave us ten commandments to be in relationships with him, to be in relationships with other people. And we look at the examples within the scripture. We see that there was Adam. We see that there was Eve. We see that there was David. We see that there was Jonathan. We see that there was Paul. We see that there was Silas. We are created to be in relationships. It's very, very important. As a matter of fact, if you're here this morning, and you've not been in very good, solid relationships, you need to understand, first and foremost, that God has created you to be in relationships. May, maybe it might be very awkward. It may be very uh, unusual for you to start becoming out of your social shell. But uh, God wants you to do that. It would be very beneficial for you to do that. Point number two. Now, this is how... This is how we're going to build real good relationship. This is how that we build. We take those relationships that are good and we make them better. So point number two, keep your emotions in check. 
Have you ever been upset or your, your emotions were just in high gear and you really wanted to say something, but the Holy Spirit said, you know, don't, don't, don't let those words come out of your lips. Hey, can, you, can I get an amen? Like, you were really upset and you knew not to say those words because your emotions were controlling you and not the love of Christ that was controlling you. Or, or you wanted to punch somebody in the neck and you really, you really wanted to do it, but then afterwards you wanted to smile at them and say, Jesus loves you. You really wanted to do that. But, but you didn't. The, the Spirit held you back. So you're learning. If you're going to build good, healthy relationships, you're going to, there's going to be times in your marriage, as a parent, as, as, a, as a co-worker, there's going to be times where you have to keep your emotion in check. Don't be like a teenager. Because teenagers don't know how to keep their emotions in check. We're, we're mature, we're, we're developing, we're growing in God's grace, so we're going to do that. I want you to write the scripture down just as a reference, and I want you to remember this. Proverbs chapter 17, verse 14. Proverbs chapter 17, verse 14. The beginning of strife is as when one lets water out. Therefore, leave off contention before it starts. Have you ever seen somebody say a word? And maybe it's not so much as the words that they say as much as how they say it. Can I get an amen out of that? It's not what you say. Sometimes it's the emotion. It's charged up. And it can create a lot of fi friction. And some people are really explosive. And if you're one of those people, you need to pray that God helps to keep your emotion in check. Maybe if you're, you're that kind of person, if you can be volcanic and just it starts spewing. I mean, because let's face it, folks. Once, once the water starts, the dam can break. Somebody say amen. The damage can be done. That's, so you've got, you got to learn to hold the water back. And basically what this is saying in Proverbs chapter 17 is, you you got to keep your emotions in check. Somebody somebody may not understand. Somebody may not fully be aware. Maybe that they've even offended you. And you you got to keep those emotions in check because if you're not careful, it can escalate and escalate really quick. So this morning, I want to share four ways that we can help to do this. There are four ways that we can help to keep our emotions in check. And if you're, you're the kind of person who you, you just let everything roll off your back and, and you're always cool, I still want you to write these down too because maybe this will, at some point, you might be able to share with someone else. But there's four ways that the Scripture teaches us how you keep your emotions in check. Number one, the first way, control your rage. Control your rage. Your rage. Did you know the Bible says it's okay to be angry? Did you know the Bible says that? That's, that's an emotion. That's an emotion that God has. Every single emotion that you have, every single emotion that you have ever experienced, it comes from God. Your emotions are good, they are healthy, and they are proper. But when they get out of control, they are going to hurt other people. If you believe that, say amen. So you've got to learn to control your rage. The Bible tells us in Ephesians, the Bible says, be angry and sin not. So it's okay to get angry. I would strongly recommend if you get angry at your child, take, you take the time out and you go in your room and holler in your pillow. Whatever you do, don't kick the dog. Don't take it out on your wife. Don't take your family problems into work. Boy, can I get an amen out of that? Oh, my goodness. Learn to control your rage. In the book of Nehemiah, we see that Nehemiah, he, he's, a, he's a great godly man. He's involved in the restoration of the city of Jerusalem. And while he is working so hard to bring spiritual revival and renewal 
rebuild the walls. The people are starved, not only physically, but spiritually for the presence of God. And he finds out that while, while he is in the midst of this, he finds that while he's in the midst of this building project and the spiritual renewal process as well, he finds out that there are certain leaders in his administration who are treating the common worker people wrong. And the Bible says in the, in the book of Nehemiah that he gets so angry that he has to leave. He physically leaves. Because if he stays there, he knows he's going to say some words and they're probably not going to be in the spirit of grace that they need to be said. Now, I'm not going to ask you to show your hands, but I believe that every single one of us can probably, regrettably, remember a time where we just said the first words that just came to our mouth and we looked the person in the face and boy, we done some hurt, didn't we? Mm. And God says, keep your emotions in check. The first, the first thing you're going to have to do is learn to control your rage. The second way that we keep our emotion in check, the second way is make quick restoration. Do it quickly. Make restoration. Sometimes the hardest thing that you will ever do in your relationships is to make restitution. And God, being a God of grace and forgiveness, says you need to make restitution restitution now here's here's the hard part about restitution because i'm just going to be honest with you the two hardest words in the english language to say say it with me i'm sorry it's the hardest words isn't it have, have you ever have you ever seen your kids get in an argument and regardless of who started it you tell them you look at one another and say i'm sorry and then they go like this i'm sorry and they're really not sorry are, are you really making restitution? Are you really, are you really with a heart of being humble? You, you, might, you might want to write this down when we come to this part here. Let everything be small. Let everything be small. The big thing in your life, the big thing in your life is to love God because that's the most important. Jesus says in Matthew chapter 22, verse 37, He says that the great commandment is this, to love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. But oh my goodness, when we live life like every single thing is so important, why do we argue over stuff that doesn't really matter? Why, why do we get so bent out of shape out of stuff that's not important? Did you know wars have started over stuff that's really not important? Make quick restitution. Make quick restoration. You, you want to you do this. Now, the Bible tells us of an uh, Old Testament example. talks about a guy by the name of Nabal. Nabal was very rich. He was very powerful, but he was very self-centered. He's kind of a selfish person. And so he was, he's the kind of person who doesn't forgive. He's the kind of person who says, I'll forgive, but I can't forget. That's not really making restoration. That's really not making restitution. And so David, David who's already been anointed as king and has a following of very strong and valiant men, he just doesn't have a kingdom yet because King Saul, the first king over Israel, is trying to hunt down David and to kill him. So he's a renegade right now. And so he comes into this place of Nabal's and he's watching over, he's protecting the flocks. He's watching over the property of Nabal during this time frame. And then David dispatches two of his men to go and talk to Nabal and say, hey, look, we've been protecting your property. We've been looking over your flocks. We're not going to ask for a whole lot. We, we just want, as part of payment, we just want to receive some of the goodness. We want some of your food, and we want some of your, your just as payment of what we've done. It wasn't a whole lot. And it's just showing favoritism to say, you know what, Here, here's a gift of appreciation. Well, he insults them. He insults 
their leader, David, and they get mistreated because he's selfish and he says, I'm not going to do that. I, and I, I tell you, some of the most people who have hurt me the most are ones who are ungrateful. I'm not asking for payment. I'm not asking for you to look at me and tell me that I'm a great person. But man, if they're ungrateful and they have an ungrateful spirit, it can hurt, can it? Can I get an amen out of that? Well, man, Nabal's wife, Abigail, finds out about this situation, and I want you to notice what she does. Even though she's not the one who's involved with this, she knows that her husband sometimes can be very unreasonable. And I want you to notice what takes place in 1 Samuel chapter 25, verse 18. Abigail made haste, took 200 loaves of bread, two bottles of wine, five sheep, dressed them, and took five measures of wheat and a hundred clusters of raisin. You know what she's doing? She's t taking that as payment. Well, if my husband won't do it, I'm going to do what's right. And let me tell you something, folks. God never calls you to do what's convenient. He never calls you to do what's easy. He calls you to do what's right. And making restitution is right. As a matter of fact, Jesus says this. You can look it up in the New Testament. Jesus says if you come into church and you come to this altar and you know that somebody has got something against you, he says before you leave your gift on the altar, you go and make restitution with that somebody. Now you guys need to say amen on that one. And this, this is powerful. And when we allow our emotions to get in the way because sometimes, oh man, I'm right. I know I'm right. And then... What we do, we act like a third grader because we don't keep our emotions in check and then we run to somebody else and then we talk to them about what so-and-so did to us. And the reason that we're trying to do that is we want them to validate our feelings, say amen. And now you've got a third person involved that doesn't need, need to be involved in this. That's why the Scripture says if you have somebody against someone, you need to go to that person alone and not on Facebook say amen now the third way the third way we must release our ego we must release our ego the Bible tells us in Proverbs chapter 28 verse 25 those that have a proud heart stir up strife because their pride always gets in the way. Their pride always gets in the way. And then the fourth one is have real communication. I'm going to share what the Scripture says about that. There, there's three ways that the Bible is very plain about having real communication. If you want to build your relationships better, then we have to learn how to have real communication. Boy, this is so important with your children. Make sure that you're taking time with your children, your grandchildren. Uh, those relationships that you count valuable uh, to you in your life, if you want them to flourish, you want them to, to grow and to prosper. You have to have proper communication. Anything that you put valuable time into is going to grow. It's going to flourish. It's going to produce fruit. That's the law of the harvest and it's the law of communication that God tells us. So there's three ways. There's three ways that the Bible tells us this is how you can have communication. First of all, number one, say what you mean. Say what you mean. Don't don't beat around the bush. Don't try to impress somebody. And don't just be speaking just to be speaking. But say what you mean. Jesus says this. Jesus says in Matthew chapter 5, verse 37, he says, keep it simple. Just say yes or no. Anything beyond this comes from the evil one. Keep your communication simple. Just say what you mean. I think. God would often want us to choose our words wisely. If you look back, I, I think that if you look back in our text that we read, doesn't it say wise words? It doesn't say your first words. 
It says, wise words, wise words, say amen. Just say what you mean. Now, the second way is speak truth in love. Speak truth in love. The Bible tells us in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 15, speak truth in love. So you're, you're just speaking truth. But when you do, say it out of love. And I know that can be hard. I know that sometimes we can get really charged up. We can have a lot of static within our emotions. And we just want to blur it out. Especially if somebody does something to hurt us. We have this natural tendency to want to hurt other people back. Boy, I'm going to get them. I'm going to really zing them. And then the third way, and this is also in Ephesians chapter 4, but it's in verse 26. Talk it out. Talk it out. Because this is what's going to happen. If you've got something that's burning and fuming inside of you, you're not going to sleep at night. You're going to be fueled up by these emotions. And even if you do fall asleep that night, what's going to be the first thing that's on your mind when you wake up in the morning? That same thing. That's why, that's why the Bible says, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 15 says, speak the truth, but when you speak it, speak it in love. And that's why the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 26, don't let the sun go down on your wrath. Talk it out. Talk it out. Man, it's, it's hard, it's difficult. But one of the most important key elements that you can take into your relationships is to actually be honest and to talk things out. I know I do. If somebody says something I'm not for sure, or sometimes my mind is not processing what they just said, I'll pull them away, away from other people. If you guys are with me, say amen. And then I'll, I will say, hey, I'm not for sure what you just said but here's what in my own words here's what i heard you say and boy if you just take the time i'd say about 90 percent of the time when you take that kind of approach you can clear up and it's not at all what you thought it was but when you don't and you let your emotion get in the way it can create a very big mess so speak the truth in love say what you mean and talk it out. Point number three. Point number three this morning. Strive to maintain beneficial relationships. Strive to maintain beneficial relationships. I'm just going to say it as plain as I can say it. If you are in a relationship that is sucking the life out of you, that's not beneficial. I strongly recommend that you cut ties in that relationship if you're in relationships that is causing you to compromise your christian faith you need to cut ties with that relationship if you're in a situation that is compromising your values your stance your character you need to get out of that that's not a beneficial relationship if you're if you're in relationships that's causing you to want to beat your head against the wall i don't care how much money you're making you've got to get out of that place it's not good for you. As pastor, I've had people say, man, I, you know, I get knots in my stomach all the time as I get ready. You need to change jobs. You, you, you need to find another place to work. Take, I don't care if it's $5 an hour or less. If, if you're already feeling that, that's not a beneficial relationship that you're in. And I, I hate to say it, but you guys, you guys will have to agree with the statement. There are people who would take advantage of you and squeeze everything they can out of you, and then when they're done, they're going to go to somebody else. I don't know. I, I don't know if anybody. I don't know if anybody. Uh, I, and I'm going to date my age. Did anybody here this morning ever watch the old movie that came out in the 70s called Invasion of the Body Snatchers? You guys ever watch that, that movie? Well, there are people, if you're not careful, that there are real needy people. Not only are they needy, they are greedy. And they will latch onto you. They're just like a leech, and they will suck the very life out of you. And that's not, that's not beneficial. So one of the ways that we can build good, mutual, beneficial relationships 
is to look for certain qualities. And I want to I want to list three qualities that God says these are the relationships that you need to be in. These are the kind of relationships that you need you need to be in. They're they're proper and they're healthy and they're beneficial. And I'm going to give you three qualities that will be the the marks of relationships that God says these are okay. These are beneficial relationships for you to be in. Three qualities. Quality number one is respect. You have to have respect. You have to respect them, and they need to respect you. That's willingness to allow you to talk. That's willingness for you to be able to listen. And guys, let me just say this. If you've been married for a while, and your wife is talking while the football game is on TV, You married her. You didn't marry that TV. Now, I know the TV is cheaper. <laughs> and you never have to buy that TV another diamond ring. Can I get an amen? But, but, but the love of your life, the love of your life, the woman that you committed yourself to is your wife. And you love her. And so, and sometimes, here's how the female mind thinks. If you don't, if you don't believe me, go go to YouTube and type in the tale of two brains and see how they think and how they how the minds operate. The the female mind is way different than the male mind. But she'll wait until it's like the most important play of the game. And that's when she'll want to engage in conversation. I'm like, are you kidding me right now? This is this is the best part of the game. You know why she does that? Because from time to time, the woman wants to gauge how valuable the relationship is with her. So she will test that. She's, she'll test that out. Um, so guys, just remember that. Just remember, it's respect. The most healthiest relationships that you will be in all have these three qualities. And the first one is respect. They respect you. They have they're not going to ask you to do anything that would compromise your beliefs. They're not going to ask you to do anything that would compromise your values, your core values. And I say this all the time. I say this all the time, and I use it every single time that I do premarital counseling because a lot of people think that they can use this word. I'm going to help you to shift from one word to another word. You want, if you want to have good relationships that have respect, Never use the word compromise. Compromise is actually a dirty word because that means when you compromise, somebody wins and somebody loses because somebody has to give something up to win. You guys remember just a couple of weeks ago, the RTA buses weren't running in downtown Dayton. And like, okay, well, we can't negotiate. The reason that they can't negotiate is because one person's thinking what's best for them and the other person's thinking what's best for them. So they use the word compromise. The better word, and write this down, the better word is cooperate. Because when you compromise, somebody loses, somebody wins. That's compromise. But when you cooperate, you both win. Say amen. And you need to think in terms of when win the second quality the second quality that god wants you to look for is rewards you have mutual rewards in this relationship let me just list just a couple just a few of the rewards that we get to enjoy when we have a good high quality beneficial relationship some of their rewards. You get a helping hand. You guys remember the old saying, you scratch my back and I'll scratch yours. That's, that's beneficial. That's part, that's part of their rewards. Um, I had a neighbor. I had all the tools. And I had, I had this neighbor. I just, you, ever, you ever just feel like, oh, this guy's going to need a lot of help. But, you know, but he said, uh, yeah, I, I, I've, I can do this. I can... Uh, I totally got this. I said, well, 
are, are you sure you, you know how to use this chainsaw? Yeah, I, I know how to use the chainsaw. He'd seen me use my chainsaw, and so he came over and wanted to borrow it. And uh, he kept pulling on it and pulling on it and pulling on it and pulling on it. And finally, I, I went over there, and I, I got it started for him. I said, are you okay? You, you want me to do this? Oh, no, I got it. And uh, it, it continued to keep working on him. It just quit. It, it quit. Anyway, to make a long story short, he, he couldn't keep it running. Uh, he put oil where the gas was supposed to go, and he put gas where the oil was supposed to go. <clears throat> Did I tell you it was my chainsaw? <laughs> yeah, it's like, whew. yeah, I, I should have saw that one coming. There's some rewards, but the rewards are it's like, hey, let me help you, and when it comes time, you can come and help me. I'll lend you a helping hand. Here's another great benefit of very mutual beneficial uh, relationships is laughter. Who doesn't like to laugh? Did you know, did you know the Bible says this? The, and here is what's so amazing about the power and the inspiration of God's Word. Did you know that the Bible says that laughter is like a medicine? And it really wasn't until the 20th century that they started studying this more on a scientific level. They actually realized that there are certain chemicals that are beneficial for you that are released when you laugh. That's amazing. God's Word already knew that before the scientific community did. And then there's teamwork. You guys can collaborate and work together for a common good. Now the third quality that God wants you to look for in beneficial relationships is refuge. Because there are people that you'll need to be able to lean on. Man, I, I like that song. We've actually played it here. If you guys remember the 1960s song, Lean on me when you're not strong. Yeah. There, there's a lot of biblical truth to that. And the Bible does call us, as believers, the Bible does call us to bear one another's burdens. There's, there's refuge. And I'm sure every single one of us Maybe at some point in our life, we just said, man, I have just got to get this off my chest. I've had this kind of a day, and I, I've got something on my chest, and it's just burning. It's just weighing me down, and I just need to talk to somebody. And folks, we know you can't just tell everybody, so say amen on that. Because if you tell the wrong people, it, it's, it's on Facebook before you can even get home. It's on social media before you can even get home. Well, there's refuge. People that you can tell a secret to. There are people that you can tell how hurt that you felt, how you're feeling, but you keep it on a real private basis. There's shelter. There's protection. You can just spill your feelings, and somebody just absorbs that, and they're still your friend. Point number four this morning as we get ready to close, and Looking to our last point. You want to help build your relationships? You want to make your relationship stronger? This is what the Bible tells us to do. Work hard to build one another up. Work hard to build one another up. And we can do that. We can do that each and every day. You have the power. You have the ability to build people up you have the ability to build your children up like crazy insane you have the ability to lift people even at work if you're a supervisor at work the words that you say the words of encouragement and the tone of your voice even your body language conveys you're helping to build those people up i want you to write these two scriptures down then that way you'll have a reference for them later on when it comes to understanding the importance of building people up and when you do that you're really helping to solidify your relationships in jude jude only has one chapter so you only look at the verse jude verse 20 and listen to the words of encouragement that it speaks to us jude verse 20 but you dear friends must Build each other up in your most holy faith. 
pray in the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, not only are you encouraging people, not only are you building them up by the words that you say, but in verse 20, it, it talks about prayer. Praying for people. I pray for you people almost on every single daily basis because I know some of the struggles that you're going through. And I know encouragement, man, it is a great shot in the arm. Everybody needs it. Everybody needs encouragement. And so my prayer is, God, lift these people up. Help them to take that next step. Encourage them to help get through the day. Because I know that struggles can be pretty heavy. I know that worries and cares sometimes can bog us down. If we're not careful, if we are not careful, friends, if we do not watch what we do, we can allow the cares of this world to choke the happiness out of our life. And if we're not careful... We can allow cares and worries and burdens to choke the joys even out of our relationships. We want to build one another up. And the Bible says, dear friends, value that friendship. Build one another up. Say it. Speak it. And pray. And then write this one down. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 11. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 11. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 11. So encourage each other and build each other up just as you are already doing. Encourage one another. Give encouragement. You should make it a daily habit each and every day. To encourage the people who are in your life. You need to do that. You need to encourage your parents. You need to encourage your spouses. Girlfriend, boyfriend, your children, your grandchildren. You need to encourage them because people are valuing the relationships. That, and the people that you value, those relationships that you value, you need to encourage them. You need to help build them up. Very important to do that. My prayer for you today is that we take all these lessons that we've gleaned off of for the whole entire month of January and that we're willing to take these and put those into our hearts, help those to be our attitudes, and that we step off with our best foot possible and that 2017 is going to be our biggest and best year ever. Would you bow your heads with me as we get ready to have a close uh, out with the song of invitation? Heavenly Father, thank you so much. For allowing us to be in this uh, sermon series. We want to get off to a good start. Maybe there's somebody here this morning. Maybe they're in relationships that's just crippling them. Maybe they're in relationships that's squeezing the life out of them. And I want to pray today, Lord, that you give them the courage to either help get that relationship mended and fixed, or God give them the courage to to get out of that relationship so it's not causing them to compromise and it's not causing them to step away from their values, the godly life that you call us to live. And God, help us those areas that we can get better at. I pray that we would have the boldness to accept your grace and your help and that we would allow your spirit to help us to choose and to say the right words to build relationships instead of hurting them. God, first and foremost, we want to look to you. We, we just want to say, God, that we love you and our most important relationship is building it with you, building it with Christ. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.